the world price of wheat was going to double, which would be pretty bad. But now we're thinking it could quadruple and possibly even quintuple, and that's catastrophic. This is Preble Hall. Welcome to Preble Hall, a podcast about naval history from the United States Naval Academy Museum in Annapolis. Our guest today is Dr. Nick Lambert, prize-winning author of Sir John Fisher's Naval Revolution and Planning Armageddon, British Economic Warfare in the First World War. Between 2016 and 2018, he held the class of 1957 chair at the United States Naval Academy Department of History. Nick, welcome back to the Naval Academy. Welcome back to Preble Hall. Thank you. Good morning. In the old classroom as well. Do you miss it? Did you miss it? Oh, yes. Did you miss grading? That's the... No. <laughs> <laughs> and joining me as co-host today is Dr. Tyler Petroff from the Department of uh, History here at the Naval Academy. He's a class of 57 postdoc fellow. Tyler, welcome back. A pleasure to be here, as always. Nick, there's a seminal operation during World War I, Gallipoli, the Dardanelles campaign, that has been debated for more than a century what is it with your new book, and I want to make sure everybody gets the title of the book, The Warlords and the Gallipoli Disaster, How Globalized Trade Led Britain to Its Worst Defeat of the First World War. What propelled you to this topic? Well, it really all began um, during my first year at Oxford. Um, I was an economist who also did history, but primarily an, uh, primarily an economist. And I decided to audit a class by uh, Professor Sir Michael Howard who was then the Regis Professor of History at Oxford. And uh, it was the very first term, as I remember it being cold and wet outside. And um, literally, uh, it hooked me in there and then. One of the things that uh, Michael Howard said repeatedly during the class is the official records, the standard narrative of the, uh, of the origins and the inception of the campaign really don't make sense. And he would remark upon it, but he would never elaborate. For thenceforth, I determined that, I don't know, at the back of my mind was a, you know, a, a, a desire to basically find out what he meant and maybe explore this for myself. And so over the next, what, 10, 20, 30 years, I wrote a couple more books, but whenever I, I was on the lookout for material relating to the Gallipoli, uh, the origins of the Gallipoli campaign, and so when I was in the archives, I would, um, if I came across something, I would note it down, put it in the, in the file or in the box, uh, which gradually grew into three or four boxes. And, um, and these boxes and, uh, accumulated. Uh, but then there was a tipping point about 15, 20 years after this lecture series by Michael Howard, I discovered something that I wasn't supposed to discover, is that there was a, there was a set of memoirs uh, published by Lord Hankey who was the secretary for the, uh, for the, uh, the War Council, Committee of Imperial Defense, and he was the very first cabinet secretary uh, to the British cabinet. And um, he tried to publish his memoirs in 1937, and they threatened him with jail and the Official Secrets Act. And then he tried again in the 50s, and each time he watered down his manuscript. And in 1957, he made his, I think, third attempt and he submitted it, and it was submitted to a censor to review. And I found out who the censor was. It was Michael Howard. So he got to see the original uncensored memoirs, well, half-censored memoirs of Morris Hankey. So he knew, and he told me many years later, he said yes, that he had a number of very long conversations with Hankey as to the bits that were cut, should we say. Before we get any further into the subject matter specifically, I, I have to ask, you introduced this as saying you began as an economist and you sort of slid into history as a side interest as well. What would you label this book as? What kind of history is this? It is, well, history, but it's there's a lot of economics in here and there's a lot of politics in here and there's a lot of diplomacy in here. Uh, it's broad-based history that looks at the intersection of war and political economy. That would be my short answer. So could you file that under, if you don't mind me following up, could you file that under almost a uh, grand strategy or would you put that more in the military strategy? No, I wouldn't call it grand strategy because grand strategy has a specific meaning, particularly in the States. 
I mean, you've got the Edward Earl Mead uh, definition of security studies, which becomes grand strategy. And then, of course, you've got the, uh, the Yale grand strategy course as well. And they both have particular specific meanings. They much more lean towards the political aspect of what I call strategic policy. Uh, and what I call strategic policy is, is the fusion of when in a policy, who makes policy? It's the political executive. And who makes strategy? It's the admirals and the generals. And so how, who makes political strategy or strategic policy? It's uh, a fusion of the two. But grand strategy generally tends to favor the politicians to the exclusion of the, uh, the admirals and the generals. And um, which is rightly obedient to you know, the famous Klaus Witzian line about the subordination of the military to the political. Uh, but I've always thought that, 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 that there's a, it doesn't quite work because the military leaders often have a very, very different perspective, but and for very, very good reasons. And I'm rather focused on their uh, well, I, I don't privilege, but well, I, I sort of give them, I try to give them an equal voice to the politicians. In Julius Caesar's The Gallic Wars, you see the term corn or, or wheat uh, coming in again and again in terms of his decision making. And I was struck by, by this book because wheat is probably the most common word in, used in this book. And I was wondering if you could explain the importance of wheat with regard to the decision making that goes into the Dardanelles campaign, and especially what happens around November, December of 1914, that goes into this, the, the War Council's decisions and considerations. That's a very, very big question. And, we'll uh, and it I will okay. break it down into pieces. Sure. Uh, but I suppose the, you begin with the knowledge that Russia is the largest exporter of wheat in the world in 1914. And the largest importer of wheat in the world in 1914 is Great Britain. And when uh, Turkey makes the decision to join the war, actually a little bit before, um, they effectively close the Dardanelles. And if you're going to move wheat from the Ukraine to the global market, and you can't get it through the Dardanelles, you have a problem. And what is more, the world has a problem too, because if you close the Dardanelles, you're, you're not just cutting off Russia, you're also cutting off Romania. And combined, that's approximately one third of global supply. And so you know, it doesn't really take much imagination uh, to understand what happens when you cut global supply by one third. Prices are going to go up sharply and quickly. And that's exactly what happened. But it really becomes a perfect storm because you cover all the major sources for wheat, the United States, Argentina, India. It's almost like uh, uh, Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, where the merchant is waiting for his three ships to come in and the first two ships he's heard that have, they've been shipwrecked and he's about to lose everything. But what is it about those countries that's happening on the world market with regard to wheat now, Bes besides what besides the access to, to Russia. That is the perfect phrase, the, the one you just used, perfect storm. That's exactly what happened in 1914. So uh, at that time, there were just seven countries in the entire world that supplied 92% of all the exportable wheat in the world. And as you rightly say, problems developed with pretty much all of them simultaneously in the winter of 1914, some of it really quite unexpected. So not only do you have Russia and Romania cut off because of the closure of the Dardanelles, uh, but the Australian crop fails completely. Um, it's 1914 is remembered in Australia as the great drought. It was the year in which Australia, which was normally a, one of the big seven, actually has to, Im it was a net importer of wheat that year. Then a couple of months later, there are torrential rain just before the harvest in South America. Uh, there are torrential rains that about six weeks before they harvest, which wipes out 15 to 20 percent of the crop in the fields before they manage to gather it. And then in the roundabout December of 1914, there's a very, very severe freeze uh, that sets in in North America, which effectively locks up all of the wheat west of Chicago. I mean, you couldn't navigate the Great Lakes 
yes, but you couldn't use the canals either. And indeed, you couldn't get anything west of Chicago, uh, you couldn't get it out. And that affects Canada too. So there were very large quantities of wheat up in Winnipeg, but they were tied into the American transportation system. So literally, you have a perfect storm. And then the last country, the, uh, the seventh country, is India. Now, India had a particularly good crop that year. Um, unfortunately, it was too good in some ways because the price of wheat had steadily started to rise during the end of 1914, and it became cost-effective to basically export wheat out of the Punjab down by rail to Karachi and onto the world market, which caused the price of wheat in, uh, in the bazaars in northern India to virtually double, uh, which causes problems. And normally, the way to preserve civil order in India was to use the army. The problem is, is that most of the politically reliable troops were off fighting against the Germans in uh, Europe or guarding the Suez Canal. And so what the Indian government did in 1914 is they embargoed the export of wheat, much to the fury of the British government. Anyway, so you put, put, join all these factors together. And uh, so in early January 1915, they start calculating the Board of Trade and the Board of Agriculture start making projections for what these, all these factors coming together. This is literally a once in a hundred year event. Indeed, well, you could say that, but it had never happened before. Um, but and they started looking at it and they said, well, previously we thought that the, the world price of wheat was going to double, which would be pretty bad. But now we're thinking it could quadruple and possibly even quintuple, and that's catastrophic. So just to elaborate on that slightly, we are talking in the context of a, a truly global market here, like almost in the vein of the modern day. Yes. Uh, just, I, I felt like that warranted underlining simply because that's something you outline in your book as a factor in why these things haven't been seen the same way, correct, uh, in the intervening years, because they haven't been viewed in the context of a globalized economy correct. Um, until recently. Um, so as a follow-up to that, okay, we're talking about catastrophic prices of wheat in uh, Britain. Obviously, that's a problem for a lot of different reasons. But how does this connect, or I should say, how does this usurp the traditional story uh, exactly of Winston Churchill strong-arming uh, the, uh, the warlords into attacking Gallipoli? Where, where, where does this really diverge? What's different here? Well, that sort of, the, there are several threads in that question you've asked, which are sort of related to what I'm talking about, but sort of unrelated. Um, the first thing is, of course, is whenever one talks about Gallipoli, they always, the first name to come to mind is Winston Churchill. His idea, his mistake, he was the one to push it. He was the one, as you say, as you say, uh, you know, to drive it through. And, uh, you know, just by sheer uh, force of personality, persuades all the members of the War Council that this is the only solution. Um, but you have to remember that when he's proposing this, what is he actually proposing and why? What does the history book say? The history book says, well, Winston Churchill proposed this as a, as a strategic initiative to outflank the central powers, you know, to strike at the anachronous, but the soft underbelly of the central powers and knock Turkey out of the war. Um, the only problem is, is that when he first puts forward the proposal to attack at the Dardanelles, he doesn't sell it that way. What he does, in fact, is he says to the War Council, um, well, he's proposing, uh, he says, we can do the following operations. If this meets some strategic requirement you think could be useful, we can do it. So he's reversing, you know, he's basically proposing the operations that the Navy can do, and he's basically offering them up for the War Council to basically build a strategy around it. Now, Winston Churchill does start talking about the strategic advantages, but not until March of 1915, which is two months into the uh, decision. And, but it really isn't until actually after the war when he writes his uh, famous memoirs, uh, 1923, The World Crisis, where he actually uh, puts all the pieces together and presents it as a grand strategic initiative designed to basically shorten the war. And, um, you know, he's, of course, he's, um, um, he's trying to 
persuade the public that uh, he was a great uh, strategist, and if only he had been listened to, there would have been there wouldn't have been a million dead British soldiers. The war would have been over much quicker, and uh, he should be trusted with high office in future. And he was misunderstood. Well, that does seem to have at least worked out for him in the long run in some way. Yeah, um, Perhaps not in the way that he, he outlasted them. I, well, I, <laughs> yeah. think, I think Churchill outlasted them. Uh, the problem is, is that most of his critics, um, they, uh, they basically fell by the wayside um, during the 20s and the 30s, and Winston Churchill is still there. And a lot of the anger that, uh, that was directed towards him, uh, because he, his name was associated with the Gallipoli disaster and the loss of an awful lot of men, and uh, loss of prestige to the British Empire and so on and so forth. A lot of the anger slowly dissipated, uh, though not, but not, not everywhere, of course, because um, you know, in Australia in, uh, what mm -hmm. was it, 1940 or 41, no, it was in 41, you know, they're pulling divisions out of Egypt uh, because they want them to defend Australia or to represent the interests of Australia uh, rather than um, uh, Winston Churchill's uh, decision to uh, push forward in Egypt. But it's not exactly like Winston Churchill was an influential member of the cabinet. I ask, you write that Asquith says that Winston is far the most disliked man in my cabinet. But with regard to the campaign, even though Churchill is, is proposing this, he's not really consulting the military, is he? Because the, the first Lord, Sea Lord at the time, uh, Admiral Sir Jackie Fisher, is in complete disagreement with his, his suggestions, isn't he? Yes and no. The problem is, is that Winston Churchill isn't going through channels and he's managed to bring into the Admiralty a number of unofficial advisors. He's also, remember Fisher had retired in 1910 and Winston Churchill had taken over the Admiralty in, uh, what was it, October of 1911. And uh, Winston Churchill's way of running a department was to um, bring in his own men. Is that why that is that why he could suppress Fisher's reports? Yes, because Fisher is Lord. actually writing reports to Asquith, yes. but it it they they are deterred by Churchill. Well, Fisher knows that if he stands up and make and, and basically draws a line in the sand, Winston Churchill's able to point to a number of other senior officers who don't actually hold any official position within the Admiralty, although some do, um, who will say, no, we disagree with Admiral Fisher. The old boy has lost it. He's quite wrong. Um, and so it, then it, you know, there, it, Churchill's able to muddy the water sufficiently to present this as a, a slightly controversial matter. Yes, where there is an alternative point of view and that Churchill is making the executive decision to choose one option, you know, basically choose an option where there is support for this idea, but not necessarily the support for the first sea lord. And uh, Fisher is mindful of this and he basically, which compels him to uh, be very, very careful how he uh, opposes what Churchill is proposing. Well, he has to keep it in the back of his mind always. And uh, there are a bunch of options at this point. We're talking late 1914, early 1915, right? Um, so there is this perception among the government at the end of 1914 that a stalemate exists on the Western Front, as we would say nowadays, reasonably so. And there are there there is just this feeling that the government needs to cast its arms out for additional options, somewhere to start anew, somewhere to have another chance at ending the war soon. Um, and there are a bunch of options that are come up with, and Winston Churchill is a font of several of them, although he uh, favors one other than the Dardanelles at first. So how, how does this wheel turn exactly in the end of 1914 to settle on the Dardanelles, whereas all of these other options, the Balkans, uh, the Borkum operation. Alexandretta. Alexandretta, uh, um, Smyrna, uh, the assault up the Belgian coast. There's a, a host of other options yes. that are considered before the Dardanelles, uh, as late as January. Yeah. So how... what? And there's, a, and there's a dozen how? more. Yeah. There are always options. And you know, I've, I, one of the things, uh, this is a slight aside, but that was one of the, uh, the different approach I took on this book. You know, a lot of uh, traditional history uh, is with something called outcome, what I call outcome-based history. They start with a known result and then work backwards to figure out how you got there. And my, I, uh, my, my approach is uh, the exact opposite in some ways. I deal with intent-based history. So what was the intent? What was the problem they were actually trying to solve? So what was the problem they 
what, what was the problem or the problems they were trying to solve in 1914. And if you look at it this way, the picture looks and the evidence reads really quite differently. Uh, so to begin with the idea of this stalemate, a, l a number of people thought there was a stalemate. Lloyd George thought there was a stalemate. Balfour would probably agree with it. Uh, Churchill would have sort of agreed with a stalemate, but he's fairly qualified. But there was no consensus. And although there was supposed to have been a meet, there was a series of meetings planned for early January, uh, where they were going to say, right, well, working on the assumption there is a stalemate, what are the alternative options? Unfortunately, the general officers commanding in France discovered what was afoot, and so they protested and said, well, there is no stalemate in uh, the European front. You know, with a few more guns and a few more men, we would have broken through. We, we, last time, we nearly succeeded. We nearly broke through. This is a constant, this is, there's a series, and this goes, of course, right, right up to, what, 1918, the almost victories won by the British Army. Um, but. And that really creates quite a significant political problem for Asquith, the Prime Minister, because can he authorise an alternative strategy to the Western Front if the army commander in France says there is no stalemate? And it gives him pause for thought. And he's, you know, with, with Asquith, he's a very uh, cautious politician, shall we say, and he uh, basically retreated from the position that it was in fact a stalemate. He, one of the first things he does is um, he invites the general French to come over and explain his views in person. And in the end of it, they come up with a faux compromise where they say, well, you can make preparations for another offensive, but we're going to make preparations to do a whole raft of other things too. They do in the end, and, and Asquith's not the only one. There are a number of other members of the War Council who are very nervous at the idea of going against the advice of the commander of the army in the field. And so really what they do in January, instead of making a firm decision, they, do, they agree not to make a decision. And what they do instead is they authorize a whole series of studies um, across the board uh, to land in various places. As you say, there was options to go to Greece, to go to um, you know, Anatolia, uh, Syria, modern day Yugoslavia, pretty much anybody who had an idea, they said, all right, yes, let's study it. And you know, Fisher is saying, for goodness sakes, we've only got a certain number of planners and you want them to do all of this. Um, it's madness, but yeah, that's the, op the, the, the those are old orders. Okay, we'll try and work them all out. But middle of January, they haven't made any decision about anything. But the French also play a role in this because when they're when they're considering this proposal to go into Syria or or the Dardanelles, there's a French consideration, even though they're tied down in their their own country, and they also assume they control uh, any decision making with regard to naval operations in the Mediterranean. Yes. The, well, the French have always, like everybody, all of the, I mean, remember, the, there is an assumption that the war is going to be over relatively, I mean, originally it was before Christmas, mm -hmm. and then they said, well, maybe it'll be another six to nine months. Uh, but there is an assumption of a short war, and even the French are saying is, well, we can't go on for more than another year. Um, and so everybody is, has got at least one eye fixed on the post-war world. Now, one thing you have to understand about the French is, is they regarded Syria as in their sphere of operations. And any time the British sort of glanced in the direction of, um, of Syria, the French would jump up and down and get very angry and say, don't you dare, don't even look at Syria, um, or we're going to be very, very upset. And that's exactly what happened. Um, there was, in one of the meetings of the War Council on the 7th or the 8th, it was the 8th of January, um, there was a discussion of possibly landing um, at Alexandretta, and that which was strongly pushed by Kitchener as the uh, Secretary of State for War. But even the Admiralty thought, in fact, Fisher especially thought this was a very, very good idea. There are a number of excellent reasons uh, to land in Alexandretta. It really is at the center of their transportation uh, uh, hub. It's a transportation hub, and um, it was pretty much undefended. Uh, also, there was serious unrest in the region, so they had um, a reason to believe that there may have been an uprising against the, uh, the Turkish regime in Constantinople. But there are a whole raft of reasons why you might want to have gone to Alexandretta. 
Uh, but the French didn't think this idea. And although this was in a secret meeting on the 8th of January, and there were only, what, 10 or 11 men in the room, less than 48 hours later, the French ambassador goes round to the British uh, Foreign Secretary in London, uh, Sir Edward Grey, and says, we know what you're doing. We know you're thinking about going Alexandretta. Don't you dare. So part of the initial idea to go for Alexandretta, I believe you attribute to Kitchener, uh, sort of hoarding troops in uh, Egypt for purposes unknown, since he's pretty secretive from what I recall. Uh, and with the French saying, don't even think about it, that leaves a lot of these troops then sort of adrift without a well-defined mission, but in the region. Well, so you... how they end up at the last minute drifting into this operation, right? This Dardanelles operation. They're not originally even supposed to be part of it, at least not by Churchill's reckoning. Uh, how does the operation itself then come together with first the attempt to force the passage of uh, the Bosporus and, or of the Dardanelles first and then the Bosporus? And then when that fails, uh, a forced landing, which right up until I believe just a few weeks before, uh, Kitchener's reassuring his uh, men on the on uh, the spot that no, no, you you will not be making an assault. It will only be an, a, a follow up occupation. Correct. How do those troops even become part of an operation in a manner like? Well, you've that, you've you've skipped forward only a matter of weeks, but yeah. the number of times the situation has changed in the interim is extraordinary. I mean, there's constant change, you know, different perspectives, change in perspective, change in priority. It was chaos. Um, the, uh, to begin with, yes, you're quite right uh, that uh, Kitchener had sort of assembled this secret army that no one really knew existed. And so what he did was is that he was the former governor or the, the governor general of Egypt, let's call him. Um, and so whenever troops were transiting through the Suez Canal from anywhere east of Suez, he would siphon off a brigade or two and form secretly, quietly form this little army. Uh, except it wasn't so little. Uh, by about uh, January, it was up to 70,000 men, which is six divisions, should we say. The only problem is, is that most of the uh, troops are um, fairly green. They're volunteer reserves. Uh, they would be the sort of troops in the American Civil War that you had sort of, the volunteer infantry, they're a little bit better than that, but they, they're, under, they're short on equipment, short on training, they're not conditioned for the environment. Um, you wouldn't consider, they're, they're paper divisions, but within three or four months, then you could do something with it. And the, but Kitchener, as you say, um, with the connivance of various other officers in um, Egypt, were basically putting together a plan to launch an offensive at Alexandretta. At least that's the, what they thought they were doing. And so Kitchener is very, very jealously guarding this force, and he doesn't want to talk about it, and he doesn't want it talked about. Now, he's quite happy that most of the politicians seem to have forgotten about, if they even knew. Some of them are really quite surprised. And what do you mean we have 70,000 men sitting in Egypt? What are they supposed to be doing? Guarding the canal? Against who? Um, <laughs> you could do that job with maybe a couple of brigades. You don't need six divisions. So, but what changes is, um, the this this perception of a brewing pro well there, there are two uh, it, it's the close of the dardanelles when the, turkey initially joins the war the british attitude is this doesn't really matter very much to us the turks can't hurt any critical interests of ours who cares what they do they're probably going to implode anyway so we'll just ignore them and uh, you know the, technically speaking uh, the war begins sometime in november there's some dispute because it appears that the Admiralty declare war on Turkey around about the 2nd of November, uh, but the rest of the cabinet and the army don't actually join in until about the 4th or 5th of November, but uh, we'll say the first week of November. Um, but from there, th th there forward, I mean, although they had many, many meetings trying to discuss what their policy, their war policy was against Turkey, they couldn't formulate one. Part of the difficulty is they didn't really want know what they were. They, wish, they rather wish the Turks would just go away. And, you know, why are they declared war on us? How, this is very inconvenient. And as to for doing something about it, well, we don't quite have the resources, except Kitchener's little uh, secret uh, army. Um, but so, the, but, uh, 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 going into January, there is no policy. But unfortunately, 
um, in January, it rapidly becomes appear, it becomes apparent to the British government that actually Turkey can hurt Britain rather um, severely, as it turns out, uh, far in a way that they had, had known about, but they hadn't really paid sufficient attention to, which was shutting off for the Dardanelles. And there's two problems. Number one, of course, the effect it has on the global price of wheat. As I say, there was an expectation it was going to double and possibly quadruple. Um, but there's another problem too. Remember what I said at the beginning, who's the largest exporter of wheat in the world? It's Russia. So Russia's primary exports is wheat and they can't get it out. And Russia cannot, uh, basically the, the value of the ruble goes to nothing. By November, December of 1914, banks are refusing to exchange Russian currency into anything. They're refusing to touch it. And the Russians then try and go and borrow money on various markets around the world. And everyone says, you've got no collateral and your track record isn't exactly terrific. Um, we're not going to lend you anything. Um, and then the Russians basically sort of scratch their head a bit. And then they t turn to the British government and saying, well, you can lend us some money. And the British government's initial response is, all right, we can lend you a little bit of money. And um, they do give them an initial 20 million, which is a fairly significant sum of money. But the Russians spent it in ways that the British government hadn't previously approved of and caused um, some technical difficulties with the foreign exchange rate. Um, and then but with two weeks later, the Russians are coming back for more money. And then the British government say, how much do you want this time? And they say 100 million. And the British government is going, how much? Just to put it in perspective, that's one sixth of the national debt at that time. Um, it is a greater sum of money than the entire defense budget uh, before the war. It's a staggering sum of money. And the British government really don't want to have to give the money, that much money to the Russians, even if they could have done. There's another dynamic with the Russians as well. I think it's... Um Fisher, who wants, who suggests you're going to need at least 100,000 soldiers for Dardanelles, and there are proposals to uh, get the Greeks involved because natural, uh, a natural uh, enemy, I guess, of, of the Turks, and it would seem natural to get the Greeks involved, but the Russians are opposed to the Greeks becoming involved. Could you explain some of the dynamic internal, not only to Greece and to uh, the, the British, but also to the Russians in terms of how to use or if to use Greek support against the Turks? Well, yes, that's another level of complexity, <laughs> or layer of complexity, layer and level of complexity. Yes, the, the, the Greeks from very early on, you have for that, to understand really what's going on, the position of Greece and all this, you have to really go back to just before the First World War, um, to the summer of 1914. And everybody expected there was going to be a new war breaking out, but they thought it was going to be the Third Balkan War over the, paper, the previous two or three years, a various coalition of small uh, Balkan powers had fought a series of wars against the Turks and each other. Um, just depends on um, which war, who, which, who, who was on which side. And uh, they had pushed, pretty much pushed Turkey out of uh, Europe, just about, except for a small little bit to the north of Constantinople. Um, Unfortunately, the Turks then took this as a cue to heavily invest in uh, rearmament and um, buy themselves a new navy. And um, it was expected that um, in the summer of 1914, there would be a war between Bulgaria and Turkey on one side and Greece on the other. And uh, indeed, the British ambassador uh, to Constantinople and the one in uh, the minister in Greece was said uh, written, they were told take your vacation early because we need you back there in the at the end of the summer when we expect the war to begin um, unfortunately it didn't quite work out that way but even after the war began um, in in Europe and uh, Germany and France and Britain and Russia find themselves at war uh, there's still the question of Turkey who's continuing to mobilize and the Greeks are taking a look at what's going on um, and thinking they're coming for us. So Greece is desperate to have a major power as its supporter or ally or as its godfather figure, if you will. And so the Greeks from as early as the first week of August 1914 have been trying to get rope in the Russians and or the British or somebody to help them um, against the Turks. 
I, 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 again, I don't really want to go through a blow-by-blow -blow account, but um, this idea sort of waxes and wanes over the course of the next several months. Um, Greece is only, when Greece feels threatened by Turkey, they're anxious to join the Entente. But when they're not feeling threatened by Turkey, they sort of back off and say, well, we have to reconsider a bit. And so the Greeks are constantly uh, in the picture. And at one minute it appears that it's imminent they're going to join. Another, yes, it's the last thing that's going to get to happen. We have the rising price of wheat. Yes. With limited accessibility to wheat. We have the Russian debt problem. We have this perception of a stalemate in some quarters on the Western Front and the search for a new uh, strategic direction. We have Kitchener's forces uh, in Egypt at the time. Uh, the various plans of all of the people on the War Council. All of these things finally coalesce or, or at least they're said to coalesce in January of 1915. Asquith finally has this moment of clarity, the Prime Minister, uh, finally has this moment of clarity where he decides that Gallipoli is where something needs to happen, right? Right and wrong. It all depends on what day and what his reasoning was. So traditionally people have looked at this, of, as they say, they've, uh, you know, with, with, with the outcome-based history, they've looked at uh, the decision-making process in the, um, those ministers who were involved with the military. I suppose what you need to understand is, is that there was an inner cabinet, or technically two inner cabinets. Uh, so the cabinet of ministers is 20, which is far too well done, wieldy a body to make any, to make any decisions. And so what Asquith does uh, fairly early on in the war is he basically cuts it down to what he calls his war council, which is um, a committee that's responsible for diplomatic and military affairs. But he has another committee as well, which is called the, what you might call the Social Policy and Economic Policy Committee. Yes, and they're two parallel committees. Churchill's in the military committee, but he isn't in the social committee or the economic committee. Um, so, 19, there's a big meeting of the cabinet in uh, January uh, the 12th, 1915, and they're basically considering the various problems of the day. And they reach the, you know, this is when the figures first come in, and it looks like the price of food is going to at least double and go north of that. And the cabinet are up in arms about this and say, well, we need more information. So over the next course of the next week, they gather more information. And these, when these statistics are generated that I was mentioning earlier uh, from the Board of Trade and the Board of Agriculture. And so at the time of the next meeting, the 20th of January, they review the various options and all the other things, about two and a half hour meeting. And the decision is made that the number one priority must be the wheat problem, the food crisis. And so what they do is, is that they form a new committee, which is a, they basically, it's a new committee. It's, um, which is an amalgam of the military committee with the economic and social committee. Yes. And uh, this is something no one has ever seen before. No one has ever found these papers before. And um, you know, it's, it's a measure of the importance that Asquith himself is appointed chairman of this committee. And his deputy is the deputy prime minister, um, who is Lord Crewe. And then you have the usual experts from the Board of Agriculture and the Board of Trade and various other key offices. But it's a fairly small, tight committee. Uh, but again, there's another very interesting character who's on this committee, which is a secretary. There's a secretary appointed, which is very unusual. And you may well know his name. It's called John Maynard Keynes, the most famous economist of the 20th century. He was there. Well, John Maynard Keynes uh, was so enthusiastic at being given this position on a very, very secret committee that he didn't get the directive to burn all the papers. And so when I went to his paper, when I went to his papers at King's College, Cambridge, I found this file and inside the file are the original hand -mit written minutes of this committee that never existed. Huh. Um, I should have bought a coffee to show you. They're really quite extraordinary. You know, it lays out who said what and what happened as a result. Anyway, 22nd of January, Asquith is reviewing the various options uh, for what to do about the food problem. And uh, the, board of, uh, the, the, board of, the, the Board of Trade and the Board of Agriculture is saying, well, really, you've only got a couple of options. One is to buy up the entire, all of the, the nation's requirements to wheat and basically sell it at a considerable loss to the British public. That's politically Im impossible. Not to mention, 
Um, do you know what sort of sum of the money this is? This is something like some 260 to 280 uh, million pounds. And that's just for to get you over the summer. That's an, it's an impossible sum of money. Another option they consider is maybe introducing rationing. And this is a Liberal government. And the last thing that the Liberal government wants to do is introduce rationing. And they lay out the various other alternatives, only a couple of minor ones. And then, uh, according to the minutes by John Maynard Keynes, you know, Asquith finally puts his foot down and says, no, we're not going to do any of this nonsense. He's saying it would be much easier and much cheaper if we stormed the Dardanelles. 22nd of January. He then directs Keynes to write up the minutes in a paper for the cabinet, which he duly does. Uh, on the 25th, and Keynes's memorandum lays out, basically confirms what Asquith has said and explains the reasoning. And copies of these are basically distributed to members of the War Council um, who are meeting on the 28th. Uh, now, the War Council is the one that is supposed to be the military diplomatic committee that's responsible for war policy. Yes. But what has happened is the decision to attack and do something at the Dardanelles was actually taken in this economics committee. Yes, of which Asquith is head, and it's brought over to this diplomatic military committee of which Asquith is head. Yes, and it is basically presented by Asquith as a fait accompli. This is, this is what we're doing, and there are certain people who were in one committee, and there are certain people who weren't in the, who were or weren't and didn't know. And one of the key people is Winston Churchill. He knew nothing about this other committee. He wasn't part of it. And so when Churchill stands up and says, "Well," I have an operation I can do, which is um, to storm, you know, to basically force passage through the Dardanelles. Uh, Fisher's caught somewhat flat-footed, uh, but Asquith says, "Yes, this will do nicely. Uh, we know just what we're going. We know we we will let this go ahead." But the, there was no discussion in that meeting of what the rationale was, the strategy for it. There was it wasn't mentioned because they, those decisions had all been reviewed and uh, the, con uh, the conclusions reached at a completely different committee several days earlier. Let's go back to those sources, Nick, because I think one of the real strengths, and there are many strengths to this book, you know, as you can tell how all the, uh, <laughs> how I've underlined almost every page and, and dog-eared them, but are the primary sources. And you mentioned early on in the book that the official minutes of the War Council uh, don't contain a full record of the decision-making but as with John Maynard Keynes uh, notes, there are other sources that you find. And, and I was reminded at the time I was up at Winterthur um, in Delaware looking through Admiral Samuel DuPont's letters, extensive letters of the Civil War, and all the operations he's discussing with his wife. There is a character in this book, mm -hmm. Venetia Stanley, and I yes. would like you to explain why we know so much about this because of Venetia Stanley. Well, Venetia Stanley, and there are a couple of others. Um, it, her sister as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Sylvia Henley. Uh, that she came a little bit later. But then there was, um, you know, and, and if they're, they're either talking to their wives, their mistresses, or some of their friends and their confidants, they're all are. But yes, the best single source uh, for the man at the top, Asquith, is uh, Asquith's letter to Venetia Stanley. He would write to her once to, and he, he was what I should sort of say, he was about, what, about sixty, and she's about twenty-four. He was absolutely infatuated with her. Whenever he wrote to her, he wasn't writing to her, he was actually writing for himself in many ways. Yes, whenever he thought about her, he was calm and peaceful and he could order his thoughts. It's quite extraordinary. And he would bait her, and he would send her these letters and he would tell her everything. Oh well, yeah, I mean he's saying uh, December thirtieth, nineteen fourteen, he, he writes with very quote, very secret news. Yes. <laughs> While he's on the train, yeah. and there's another occasion where there are these secret, uh, these flimsies with uh, ultra confidential uh, secrets being said, or uh, communications from uh, the general co commanding in France, General French. There's supposed to be only six copies and on flimsy paper, and um, you know he basically gives her one, and she tears it up and throws it out the window of the train, and the policeman come finds it, and there's a huge inquiry, and everyone goes, well they. They decide that they, they should they should have an inquiry in due course and figure out. But Asquith knew where it came from. Uh, but then uh, other times he's in the cabinet or he's in the meetings of the War Council and he's writing to her. He's listening with one ear as to what's you know, going. Maybe I don't know. Asquith is droning or, or sort of you know, Churchill droning on about something, or he's having an argument with Haldane or whoever. And Asquith is there just listening with one ear and writing to her. 
and saying there's a big argument going on between Asquith and Kitchener and you know, it's a, sorry not Asquith and Kitchener Churchill yeah, Kitchener and Churchill thinks that we should do this because XYZ I now think that it'd be better to do that and then he would stop his letter and then maybe in between meetings he would add a bit or he would attend another meeting and add another few lines and so you have a record of the state of his mind Yes, this changing almost hour by hour. Yes, and she kept. Where did she keep those letters? She kept all the letters. Where, where did they end up? Uh, Certainly well, not they at ended National up Archives. In, uh, originally, they were at Trinity College, Cambridge, but then they were removed from Trinity College, Cambridge, and they were moved to the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Uh, but they are quite extraordinary, and, and they're particularly significant too. Not just because they, of course, the insight into his mind hour by hour, like you said, but also because there really weren't comprehensive minutes available for most of the War Council meetings, right? Or, or at least not what we would consider comprehensive minutes. It was really... Well, they're even more problematic than that. So yeah. most of the histories have been written on using these War Council minutes. And, uh, but there are such large gaps. You know from the record how long, you can find out fairly easy how long the meeting took. And you look at these minutes and you think, well, this is maybe 20 minutes of discussion. What were they doing for the other two hours? And so that caused me to start looking at where these minutes came from. And what I discovered was, is that these minutes weren't in fact the original minutes. When there was, uh, it's in the introductory chapter. So um, when they decided to, um, in the middle of the war, they decided to have this appoint Dardanelles Commission to make an inquiry into how this disaster occurred. Um, the head of the commission found out that there's some records had been taken of the, uh, of the meeting and initially Asquith said no you're not going to show these minutes to uh, the commission but the commission basically threatened trouble unless they got to see something and so what Asquith said was right fine you are what you're going to do is you're going to print up the minutes of your handwritten notes Mr Hankey or Colonel Hankey I should say you're going to print them up, but you're going to remove any references to ongoing diplomatic negotiations or anything relating to present or potentially future military operations. And a few other bits and pieces that we rather that didn't appear in there. And so what he did was is that he supplied an edited copy of the minutes. Was he also coordinating the testimony? Because you yes. mentioned that they, they all coordinated their testimony yes. for this commission. Yes. The, yes, the commission was, uh, everybody had something to hide. You know, everybody knew that the commission was out for scapegoats. And the initial ones who thought that they were going to be, sta well, the ones who were originally staked out for sacrifice were Winston Churchill and Jackie Fisher. And because they were denied, in, in preparing their evidence, they were denied access to official government documents. Uh, nobody else was, only those two were. And so what they did was, is that they, uh, they had had a big feud uh, which had, uh, they hadn't spoken to each other for a year. And so when they realized they were both staked out, they basically settled their differences. They worked through intermediaries, mm -hmm. uh, settled their differences and uh, concerted their stories. And so uh, there's a couple of letters I found and I mean, I've found some of the correspondence between the intermediaries and you have you know, Fisher writing to uh, Churchill saying, well, if you say this, I will say that. If you show them this document, I will see you and raise you and show them this document I have a copy of, yes? And so they were blackmailing each other and negotiating with each other at the same time to invent a history of what they, what actually happened. And they actually compiled, you know, they, they, they actually did better than that. They actually forged certain documents, yes, in order to introduce uh, into the documentary record. And it's worth mentioning this happened, this inquiry was very soon after Yes, uh, the Dardanelles too. Like the, the war was still going on. Oh yes, remember. it so was. It, they was... started taking evidence in September of sixteen. So what would be that? That's uh, only nine months after the evacuation. So. Which, in some quarters, you could see as an amount of justification for Asquith trying to hide ongoing diplomatic negotiations or future operations. Yeah. But at the same time, especially from historians' perspective, it's just. It's politics, right? Yes, it's more, more than anything else. And it's the, the point being is, is that you know, this is histor historians have got to be very, very careful when they find a ready-made statement. Um, you sort of need to you know, sniff it and gen <laughs> gently poke it with a stick to see, uh, treat it with gravest suspicion. In that vein of Asquith's mind finally being made up, it doesn't stay that way, right? 
He comes to the War Council with, this is what we're going to do. And then before it can even begin in March, he's already suddenly casting about again for a strategic reason for the Dardanelles campaign. What... I, I feel like I'm asking the what happened question so much, but why does well, the, wheat the, stop being his overriding uh, directive in that uh, in that vein? Because they're a uh, I mean, the situation is constantly changing. It's uh, this is uh, but this book is really about the decision making process. Yes, mm -hmm. how messy it is, and it's looking at the military side of it and the executive side or the political side in a very yes. truncated way i mean the, most of the mm -hmm. book takes place in what about maybe three three and a half weeks yes and it's literally trying to basically piece together and it's so it's decision making process itself is the focus of the set of, of the central chapters in the book and uh, what it is saying it's i mean i think the best analogy i can come with is it's making decisions under these sorts of conditions and circumstances in more time is like operating in a blizzard you're lucky if you can see a finger in front of your nose. You're being buffeted left, right, front, and back. Yes, there's some new consideration. So yes, uh, I mean, the wheat problem didn't go away. It's just it became eclipsed by another problem. And then that was eclipsed by something else and so on and so on and so forth. But the most probably there, there was a, there was a, a point in uh, February, the uh, late February, when uh, the British government's afraid that the Russians are out of the war. And this is a, cat a, cat a cat catastrophe. And so they're then saying is, well, what can we do? We've got to do something to help the Russians. Um, and that get the idea of doing something in the Russians is, well, we've got this operation going on down at the Dardanelles. Let's sort of, uh, what else can we, how can we best exploit this? And so they throw in more resources and uh, they attach greater importance to it. Uh, whole raft of things. They send a whole pile of ammunition that was supposed to go for, to, from France down to the Mediterranean, uh, to, 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 to the Mediterranean, to ensure that the operation is more successful or to increase the probability. And it's really at that point that things just sort of start ballooning out of control without any real planning. Yeah, well, uh, yes, and and there's a. This is the point whereby the. Um, the, the Navy, uh, particularly Fisher, is saying enough is enough. You've got to slow down. This has to be thought through. And he's finding out that increasing numbers um, of army officers are feeling exactly the same way about it. And they're begging the government to slow down and give the staff a chance to figure out the way, the best way forward. And the Asquith is saying, no, no, no time, no time. You know, you normally have a picture of the, the military trying desperately trying to basically launch an operation and the politicians holding them back. In this case, it's the exact opposite. And to wrap this up, I want to go back to uh, something I alluded to earlier with regard to the Merchant of Venice, where the merchant is waiting for three ships. To, his first two treasure ships have, have been shipwrecked. And then suddenly, miraculously, the third one comes in and he's a very wealthy man. This is exactly what happens, you say, a fortnight after the landings. We suddenly opens up again. The Canadian wheat, the U.S. wheat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wheat is no longer a problem. The reason, prime, primary reason for driving this campaign in terms of decision making, Nick, why didn't the British government say that is no longer the strategic impetus for this campaign? Let's get them out of there. As so often happens when you go to war, things tend to get out of hand. And I think it's rather got out of hand. So yes, the landings go in on the 25th of April. And uh, there's a couple of letters in here that Fisher's writing that morning and he's saying, this is going to be a disaster. For another nine months. Yes. He's, he, well, he's just saying it's going to be mm -hmm. a catastrophe. He doesn't even think they're going to get ashore. Right. Uh, the other thing I found is that I went to all of the other senior generals who were connected with the operation, including uh, there was a couple of generals in theater uh, there was General Maxwell down in Egypt, who was privy to a lot of the information. There was a retired field marshal, who was the Governor General of Malta, who had access to all the information because of the communications uh, centre and intelligence centre passed right through his office, so he got to read everything. Um, anyway, he and, and before before the landings, all of these general officers were saying, "You must be mad. This is a." very, very high risk operation. And if it goes wrong, it's going to be a disaster. 
And so you've got you know, a field marshal, you've got um, the theater commander, the senior officer in the Mediterranean agreeing. And then the only person who doesn't is the, the army commander for the invasion force, Hamilton. Although originally he had said he didn't think it was possible, except he was told by Kitchener that wasn't an acceptable opinion. So he changed it. Um, but all his subordinate corps commanders and divisional commanders, I've tra tracked their correspondence too, every one of them said, this is a terrible idea. Dr. Tyler Petroff, thanks for coming over and co-hosting today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Always a pleasure to talk to you and, of course, to Dr. Lambert. And Dr. Nick Lambert, author of The Warlords and the Gallipoli Disaster, How Globalized Trade Led Britain to Its Worst Defeat of the First World War. Nick, it was an absolute pleasure to have you back and discuss your book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave feedback any platform you're listening to this. Have a great day, and remember... Hold fast, this too shall pass. Preble Hall is in no way intended to reflect the official positions of the Department of the Navy or the Naval Academy.